Hi all and welcome to our 19th lecture. In the previous class we started uh, signalized intersections concepts and today we are going to continue that and start with talking about saturation flow rate. On this slide we want to talk about the concept of saturation flow rate. Before going there I want you to remember flow rate and the relationship that flow rate had with headway. So if you look at this equation that I have here, let's for a second assume that S is flow rate and H is headway. The flow rate is in vehicles per hour and the headway is in seconds. So the relationship that we have between saturation, uh, between flow rate and headway is that the flow rate is equal to 3600 divided by H. So if you have H vehicles, or if you have one vehicle every H seconds, in one hour, you're gonna have 3600 divided by H vehicle flowing through the link. So what is saturation flow rate? Saturation flow rate is the maximum flow rate that you're gonna observe that is going to pass through an intersection and there is an assumption there which is a big assumption we are going to assume that the signal indication stays green forever when we are measuring the saturation flow rate so thinking about the relationship between flow rate and headway we are going to have the same relationship between saturation flow rate and saturation headway saturation flow rate is equal to 3600 divided by saturation headway and that is shown by the equation that you see on this slide now we have more assumptions here saturation flow rate assumes that there is a constant vehicle demand that is present so if you do not have enough demand going through the intersection, you won't be able to observe saturation flow rate. Now, if you wanna know what is a typical saturation flow rate, usually we use 1900 passenger cars per hour per lane. And this is associated to a saturation headway of 1.9 seconds. So if you put 1.9 seconds in the equation that I showed in the previous um, slide, you get a number that is very close to 1900. Now, I would like for you guys to think about factors that can affect the maximum flow rate or saturation flow rate the maximum number of vehicles that can pass the stop bar at an intersection if the signal is green. Take a few seconds to think about those factors. What factors do you think is gonna change your saturation flow rate and how they are going to change it? Here you can see the list of those factors and I want to go through each of these and explain how they will be changing our saturation flow rate. So for a second think about lane width. If your lane width is narrow, let's say it's not 12 feet, it is 10 feet. Do you think that you can process more vehicles than let's say the assumed 1900 passenger cars per hour per lane or less? If the lane is narrower than 12 feet, we are gonna be able to process fewer vehicles. How about grades? Let's say we are going, we are getting to an intersection and we are on an uphill. Do you think the saturation flow rate is gonna be more or less? It's gonna be less. How about when we are going on a downhill or downgrade? the saturation flow is likely to be more. How about curbside parking? 
when you have a lot of curbside parking activity, do you think you're going to process more vehicles or less? The chances are that we are going to process fewer vehicles because those vehicles that are parking are going to interfere with the flow of vehicles there. The same is true for the distribution of traffic on different lanes. So let's say you have two lanes and the traffic is distributed 50-50. Do you think you're going to have more saturation flow rate? compared to a condition where 80% of your traffic is using one lane and 20% using the other lane. So we think that if we have a uniform distribution, the saturation flow rate is going to be higher. The level of roadside development, how do you think that is going to influence the saturation flow rate? If you have a lot of development on the roadside, Chances are your drivers are looking at something other than driving uh, and the saturation flow rate is going to be less. You may have more pedestrian activity. You may have more parking activities as well. So the saturation flow rate is going to be uh, less than the condition that you don't have that much development. Bus stops. It's very similar to curbside parking. If you have too many bus stops and uh, bus going in and out of a bus station, the saturation flow rate is going to be lower. If you have many pedestrians that are influencing your traffic, bicycles or heavy vehicles, we expect the saturation flow rate to be lower. How about lanes? that are used for left or right turns compared to lanes that are used for true traffic. Do you think a saturation flow rate for a left turn lane is more or less than the saturation flow rate of a true lane? We expect it to be lower. Can you think about why it's going to be lower? Because vehicles have to reduce their speed to make that turning movement. So now I would like you to think about a right turn lane and a left turn lane. Which one do you think is going to have a lower saturation flow rate? A right turn lane or a left turn lane? Well, if you want to find the answer, you need to think about the speed that a vehicle is going to have when making a left turn versus when making a right turn. Usually, right turns have a shorter radius. As a result, you need to reduce your speed more. So you are driving slower when you're making a right turn. And as a result, right turn lanes have a lower saturation flow rate compared to left turn lanes. Also, if you have a lane, a left hand lane, for, for instance, that has a protected face by itself. And by protected face, we mean a left turn arrow. The saturation flow rate of that left turn lane is, of course, more than the saturation flow rate of a lane that does not have that left turn arrow. Why? Because vehicles need to yield to upcoming traffic to make their turning. So highway capacity manual has an approach that accounts for all of these factors that we discussed. So you start from a base saturation flow rate and there is 10 or 11 factors that are defined for each of the parameters or the, the factors that we talked about and they reduce or increase the saturation flow rate from that base saturation flow rate that we have. So a better term rather than reduce or increase is that they adjust the saturation flow rate. Now if we are measuring saturation flow rate in the field we don't need to make any of the adjustment but if we are using what is presented in the highway capacity manual, 
then we need to go through all of those adjustments. Now in this course, we don't go through them. That's something that uh, you will be learning in traffic operations course. So in this course, always the saturation flow rate, the adjusted saturation flow rate is given to you. The next concept that I want to talk about is loss time. And this is a time that is wasted during a cycle length and it is not used efficiently or it is not used at all by vehicles to go through the intersection. And if you think about it, when the signal turns green from red, it's going to take driver some time to recognize that the signal is changed and then make the decision to go and get up to the speed that they want and then go through the intersection and some time during this transaction is lost this is called startup loss time we show it with l1 and usually it is experienced by the first um, couple of vehicles as you can see this on this figure uh, the startup loss time is usually experienced by first few vehicles and you see a lot of that on the first vehicle a little bit less on the follower a little bit less on the next one and pretty much at some point it's gonna fade away and it's gonna go and for the other vehicles you don't see much of time that is lost and you can see that they go through the intersection with the saturation flow rate now is this figure realistic that the headway between all vehicles is exactly the same? No, it's not realistic. These headways are going to be slightly different. It's not going to be exactly saturation flow rate or maybe 1.9 seconds. It's going to be a little bit more or less and you're going to see some fluctuations. But uh, what you see on this figure is that there is some time that is lost when the first vehicle goes through the intersection and that loss that time that is lost is going to be reduced and it's going to go away usually the startup loss time in an in an intersection if no information is given to you is we, we assume that it is around two seconds now how about clearance loss time i told you there are two components to loss time the other component is when uh, we are switching from green to yellow, all red and red, and we are going to stop the movement of traffic. Stopping the traffic is not happening instantaneously. So there's some time that is lost. And usually the last second of yellow is lost and vehicles don't use it to go to the intersection. If you think about it during all red, Usually vehicles don't go through the intersection and uh, those times are lost. Now, if you have an intersection that suffers from significant red light running, we may not have clearance loss time, but that's not a good thing. We are going to have safety issues there. But I think on this slide, you can see the difference, uh, the definition of clearance loss time and how it differs from startup loss time. So what is the total loss time at an intersection? We call it TL and that is equal to the summation of startup loss time, usually two seconds, and clearance loss time. And usually it's one second of yellow, uh, of yellow duration plus all red. So if you assume your all red is around one second, total loss time is around four seconds and that's a good assumption uh, per phase so think about it if you have one phase you're going to lose four seconds in it if you have a couple of phases you're going to lose eight seconds of the cycle length there so if we have an intersection of two one-way streets as i'm showing you here and we have only two phases what is happening here that is that for some time we give this movement green and then we switch it and we will give this movement green so when we make 
movement number one green we lose two seconds at the beginning and when we want to end it we lose another two seconds so that's a total of four seconds the same thing is going to happen for the other movement so here for this movement we also use two seconds at the beginning and we use another two seconds when we terminate it so we lose four seconds so you can see that in each cycle a total of eight seconds is lost in this example so after talking about lost time what we know is that not all of the green time that we are providing to a phase is going to be used effectively so what we want to find out is the effective green duration or the duration of the green time that is used effectively we call it effective green and we show it with small g rather than capital G and the duration or the amount of effective green can be found using this equation that I have shown you here on this slide so it is equal to the actual green duration plus the actual yellow duration plus the all red minus total loss time and if you think about it if this is my total green this is our total yellow and this is all our all, all, all red we know that a little bit of green at the beginning is not used and we call it l1 we know that none of the all red and some of yellow also are not used so we call that l2 and what is used is this part that includes some of the green and some of the yellow time this is our effective green so if you look at this figure we can tell that g plus y plus a r is the total duration that i have on the top and that's equal to l1 plus g plus l2 which is the total duration that i have on the bottom so i can write g plus y plus a r is equal to l1 plus l2 plus g what is l1 plus l2 it is equal to tl so if you look at that e equation there you can say that g is equal to capital g plus y plus a r minus tl that's the equation that i have up there so similar to effective green we have effective red that's what you see here so that's the duration of time that is used effectively as red and we show it by small r and it's equal to capital R or actual red indications duration plus total loss time. So that's the time that no vehicle is going through the intersection from a certain lane group. So that is what we define as effective red. And finally, there is one last relationship that I'm showing you with respect to effective green and effective red and that tells you that 
effective red is equal to your cycle length minus g or your cycle length is equal to your effective red plus effective green. The next concept that we would talk about is the capacity of a lane group. We show it with small c. The capacity is defined as saturation flow rate or S multiplied by G divided by C. So if you think about it, uh, if you think about the definition of saturation flow rate, that's the maximum flow rate that you can process if you assume that your signal indication is always green. But we know that signal indication is not always green. So what proportion of time is signal indication green? That proportion is given to you by G over C. If you remember, C is the cycle length. So every C seconds, everything repeats itself. So if your effective green is G seconds and it is green, for g seconds out of a total of c seconds or cycle length seconds the total time that your lane group is green is going to be g over c so that's the proportion of time that the lane group is receiving effective green vehicles can effectively go through the intersection on that lane group. So if you just multiply that by saturation flow rate, you can find the capacity of a lane group in vehicle per hour. So that's a very important equation that we will be using later on in this chapter. So far in this course, we have talked about many definitions and concepts pertaining to signal timing and signalized intersections and what I would like to do in the rest of this chapter is to find out what kind of phasing sequence we should use we would like to revisit the concept of lane groups and also learn a, what is a critical lane group and how we can use that in signal timing. We want to learn how to determine minimum and optimal cycle length and how to find green times for different phases. When we learn all of these, then we will go forward and learn how to determine delay for each lane group, for each approach and for the intersection and based on those, we will find the level of service. So here I'm showing you an intersection, an intersection of two uh, two-way streets. We have traffic on these streets, as I'm showing you there. So I'm just showing you now the true traffic. But what we can really have is something like what I'm showing you now. On each of these approaches, we can have vehicles going through, making a right turn or making a left turn. So we can have a two phase operation as shown here on the right hand side. On phase one, we are showing a solid green to northbound and southbound movements. So what that means is that true traffic can go, right turners can make a right turn, but those that want to make a left turn need to find enough gap in the opposing traffic. So if I want to clarify that a little bit better, this movement can go. You have a solid green. This right turn can go. The same is true for this true movement and this right turn. But when this left turn movement wants to go 
and I'm showing it with dashed line, it needs to find enough gap in traffic in, in southbound traffic so that it can make the left turn safely. So that's what is going to happen in phase one. Let's see what is happening in phase two. The exact same thing. We are showing a green circle to this movement and this movement. What that means is that what that means is that true traffic can go, right turn can go, but left turners need to yield to the opposing traffic and then they can go. So these two phases are going to repeat in each cycle and then they're going to keep repeating. So you're going to see green light that is shown here and here. Let's say for 25 seconds. Then it's going to, and at the same time, you're going to have red here that is our phase one on phase two what happens is that this movement is gonna see red this movement is going to see red and these movements are going to see green so that is our phase two and these phases are repeated with a transition so when phase two wants to finish this green is going to go away and i'm going to have yellow well, let me show it with orange so that it shows better. And this is going to last for, let's say, 3-4 seconds. Then I may or may not have an all red. If I have all red, for a second or two, you're going to see something like this. And then phase 1 will start. And I'm going to have green here green here and my phase is gonna be back to phase one so for a few seconds let's think about what is good about this phase plan what do you think is one of the main benefits you don't have too many phases so that's a good thing because if you have too many phases for each phase, you're going to have some lost time. If you think about this phase plan, I'm going to have four seconds of lost time in phase one and four seconds of lost time in phase two. So I'm going to have a total of eight seconds of lost time. And that's it. So that eight second is going to repeat in every cycle. So if each cycle is let's say a hundred seconds eight percent of that is just lost but what is some of the disadvantages of these phase plan well you can think about left turners if you have a lot of vehicles that want to make a left turn or if the traffic opposing to those left turns is too high left turners won't be able to make their left turn so the delay is going to increase the left turn pocket may be filled and the queue may spill over to the true lane and pretty much block that lane so when we want to accommodate that usually we need to come up with ways to accommodate left turners in the next slide i'm going to show you one way to do so so here what you see 
is a three phase plan so what is happening is that in phase one we are giving this green phase and also this left turn arrow green let me just draw them a little bit better and then what I have is that for everywhere else I have red so that's my phase one what is going to happen in the transition is that this green is going to turn yellow and I'm going to have this yellow arrow and then it's going to turn red if I have any all red and what will happen is that I'm going to have something like this So this is going to be my phase two and vehicles that are going southbound regardless of if they are going through left or right they just go through the, through the intersection and then I'm going to transition to yellow and then to red. And if I have all red for some time, I'm going to have something like this. And then in phase three, these are going to become green. Now left turners need to yield because I don't have a left turn arrow. So what you can see here is that if I have a lot of left turners on northbound left or southbound left, now they have a protected phase that they can use it to go through the intersection. So that's that's a good thing. I can process more left turners. But is this the best way to process left turners? No. Can someone think about why this is not the best way of processing left turners? Well, the main reason is that we usually don't have enough left turn demand or the same level of left turn demand as the level of true movement. So when we are providing phase one, we allow true traffic to go and we stop all other traffic because we want to accommodate left turners or northbound left turners but we don't have much of those vehicles so some of that time is going to be wasted and the same thing is going to happen for phase two so can you think of a way to make this a little bit more efficient compared to the phase plan that i have there well, we can give, we can have our phase one as this. Left turns go together. Phase two will look like this. And phase three is going to stay as is. So let me draw phase one for you here. Now in phase one, this movement is going to be red, this movement is going to be red, this movement and this movement is also red, but I have this green arrows. So just left turners are going to go together. That's going to be my phase one. Phase two is green arrows become red and then I allow true and right turns on northbound and southbound to go and the same is the same 
as the rest is the same. Okay, let's pause here and in the next class we will learn how to calculate minimum and optimal cycle lengths and how to allocate green to different phases in a signalized intersection. Have a good one.